Good morning. Uh, I want to hear first from uh, Kenneth Klein Connect, Deputy Manager, Deputy Manager of the uh, Gemini Project. Thank you. You're all already aware uh, the primary objective of the GT4 mission is a long duration mission, which we will be staying in orbit up to as long as four days. Uh, in addition to long duration, uh, which will extend the knowledge that we gain from the Mercury program, uh, we also will be conducting scientific and operational experiments on GT4. We'll have some 10 or 11 experiments to be conducted. And in addition, uh, there is consideration being given to possibly opening the hatches and standing up in the spacecraft, which would be the first time that uh, man has been actually in the space environment outside of his spacecraft. As far as experiments are concerned, some of them will be uh, carry-on experiments from the Mercury program, uh, evaluating the physiological effects of space flight on man. Uh, we will be repeating uh, cardiovascular effects experiment. This is both pre-flight and post-flight, exposing the astronauts to a tilt table, which uh, uh, they determine the effects on the blood, uh, muscular effects. We'll have an exerciser uh, quite similar to, <coughs> to that used in Mercury. Uh, we'll have a phonocardiogram attached to the astronaut's uh, chest in the area of the heart uh, to measure the heart sounds, compare them with electro uh, information obtained from electrocardiogram. Uh, also, we'll be studying uh, bone demineraliz demineralization. Uh, this is accomplished by x-raying various parts of the body, both before and after the flight. Uh, we'll carry on with visual observations of terrestrial objects, uh, uh, as we did in Mercury. We'll take radiation measurements both inside and outside the spacecraft. Uh, uh, various radiation packages will be installed in the spacecraft and around the astronaut to measure the radiation that he's exposed to. We will also measure radiation uh, uh, on the outside of the spacecraft. Uh, using a similar camera that we did in Mercury, the Hasselblad, we will be taking uh, uh, terrain and weather photo photographs. I guess the last uh, experiment then that I might talk about is a measurement of the uh, uh, Earth's magnetic field. This will be an instrument attached to the outside of the spacecraft. And I guess there is one more, that is uh, to measure the electrostatic charge that may be built up on the spacecraft uh, due to uh, uh, traveling through the atmosphere on exit and due to uh, the effects of operating the RCS and Ohm's thrusters uh, in flight. I think, Paul, that's... A word to say, Deacon, the crew selection. Well, I, I have no statement at all. I think we've got an outstanding group of guys assigned to this flight, obviously, and we know they're going to do a very fine job of flying it. Uh, there's been a lot of speculation, apparently, which I wasn't aware of until recently, to the effect that uh, people were surprised about not having one of the original seven in this group. There may have been some statements made as personal opinion to that effect in the past. I'm not aware of it. But there's never been any policy stated to that effect within the Manned Spacecraft Center. And I don't think we need to introduce these gents. You all know them, so from here on, it's yours. Well, obviously, I'm, I'm quite pleased. Uh, some time ago, back in about, oh, early in 1957, I 
sort of made a decision in my career as to whether I would stay in operational flying, I was a jet fighter pilot in Air Defense Squadron, or go into something along this line. <coughs> Since then, I went back to the University of Michigan and through the Air Force's test pilot school and through its aer aerospace research pilot school and was an operational test pilot. And after about eight years now, I, I seem like I'm getting close to my goal here. So uh, I, I'm sure that everyone can see that I'm quite pleased about that. Ed? I consider it uh, a great honor and opportunity to be selected onto the crew, and it's uh, kind of ironic, not ironic, but a bit of a coincidence that Jim and I have perhaps been following along right together for some time now. We were both at the University of Michigan together and lived right down the block from each other, and then we both went out to the same class, the test pilot school, and uh, there our roads split for a little while. He stayed at Edwards, and I went to Wright-Patterson Air Force Base. And uh, it seemed like for about those eight years that he's talking about, we have known each other quite well. And before, it seemed like we, uh, every time we were getting together, we were taking examinations. <laughs> now we uh, seem to be able to be reaching the fruitation of uh, past efforts. Uh, being named on a crew together, we have a responsibility to look after each other. You know, it seems like when you get named into something like this so far in advance, you immediately feel like you're going to develop two left feet and uh, uh, it reminds me a bit of last week I was talking to Jim Whitaker who is the gentleman who made the uh, climb of Mount Everest the first American to climb Mount Everest and he said the worst thing that happened to him was when 30 days before the final assault on the mountain he was named to be the American to make the assault and he said at that time he immediately felt like he couldn't even stand up and walk around. Well, I'm sure you will be able to stand up and walk around, but we'll also uh, be taking good care of each other. Frank? Well, I, I think that uh, we can second, I can second the sentiments of being happy to have been appointed. Of course, our, our main effort will be in support of uh, Jim and Ed. And in addition, we'll have to... Uh, prepare ourselves for the uh, eventuality and you know Jim might slip if he happens to walk down the stairs in front of me or something no, like won't. this <laughs> and, uh, and we have a change in crew and actually we're, uh, we're very happy and uh, be very happy to work with these, these troops and do everything we can to, to help them out at least I will be I don't know but Jim's in the Navy here and he's sort of a I'm sort of the alien here I guess they say one two three Air Force Actually, teamwork, I think, is the key to, to success, and I think you'll see more in the future now, perhaps even more than before, that uh, teamwork will pay off, and I think you'll see a very successful space program, not only in Germany, but also in Apollo. Well, yep. I'd like to say one other thing here. Ed was talking about taking tests together. I guess, really, this will be our biggest test together. I do want to say something else. I think there was... There was an ulterior motive in whoever selected Ed and I to go together. <laughs> he knows what I'm going to say. When a group of people work together the way we do, everyone's known for their idiosyncrasy. Some people have long arms, other ones have short arms or big heads or little heads or something. But Ed was always known as the biggest eater, and I was known as the second biggest eater. And we always joked that if we ever went up on the same flight, we'd probably starve to death before we came down because all the food would be gone on the first day. I, I think this is really going to be a medical experiment on how long you can live without food. <laughs> uh, are there any questions after that? Warren? I apparently no one has consulted with uh, you on this matter of crew selection when some of the guidelines were put out before. I wonder if you would elaborate a little bit on how you pick these men and uh, a little bit on the prospect that there will be a third crew pick before the first manned flight is launched this uh, winter. Well, uh, I guess what you're asking is to discuss a bit some of the criteria and approach we take to selecting crews. And about all I want to say on that is that uh, we selected these gentlemen a year and a half ago. And this is when we went through the fine exercises of making sure that we had the best people we could get. We think we've got them. 
from this point on, it's not a matter of selecting crews to fly any specific flight. It's a matter of assigning them to fly. We've got a lot of missions coming up. There are a lot of good missions, and we're just plugging people in here to our best advantage and to their best advantage to fly these missions over the long haul. I don't want to get into any detailed discussions as to how you arrive at these decisions. No, I wouldn't ask that. I was just right. wondering that this kind of a philosophy is growing out that was. Uh, is there a possibility that you will name a third crew? Uh, it's possible. I don't think we can answer that question right today. It's going to depend totally on how the flight schedules progress. I know there, would, there is going to be about eight months of training ahead of each flight then. Six to eight, that's correct. Six to eight, thank you. Nick. <clears throat> Uh, do any of you gentlemen have any trepidations in view of the fact that uh, you're two, each in each case, two freshmen going up without an old hand alongside of you? I don't. I've flown with Ed before in uh, multi-place airplanes. Uh, I've flown uh, airplanes by myself that no one checked me out in the, in the airplane. Uh, this is really the, the type of thing that we've been trained to do through our whole career is to, to make gigantic steps on our own. Uh, I'm not saying that we're not going to utilize to the fullest extent the experience of the people that have gone before us. Uh, I intend to, myself, and I'm sure that all, all the other people on the team, will work very closely with uh, the people that have flown in Mercury and also the people that will fly in GT3 before us. It would be foolhardy to go without this kind of experience. I think the one thing we want to make clear here is that there hasn't been anybody fly in space yet except freshmen. It's been strictly a first shot deal for everybody concerned. That's right. Gus will become the first sophomore. Right? That's correct. <laughs> yes, sir, Bill. Uh, I would like to ask to what extent you're taking into account in your planning for next year the possibility that Mr. Goldwater will be elected and close you down. <laughs> <laughs> Would you like to know that of anyone specifically here? Or Mr. Slayton or Mr. Slayton. Right. Well, for my point... Uh, we got a, we got enough day-to-day -day problems without being concerned about what might happen next fall, and I guess we'll just worry about what happens when it happens. I have no idea what Mr. Goldwater's opinions are along these lines. I've seen a few things in writing. We have no idea what would happen, and I don't think we would be wise to even speculate on it at this time. I don't even think that is a point. Uh, space programs have really been established as a national goal. And we're going to proceed down the road to accomplish the objectives of the program as they've been set out. And at such time as uh, there should be any change in the national uh, thinking on this, we're going to proceed in that direction. Which is another way of saying, I guess, that political science may be more difficult to comprehend than the space science. Al? Uh, Mr. Kleinknecht, would you go into a little more detail about the possibility of opening the hatch? Which of the uh, men, the pilot or co-pilot, would perform this? How long would it last, etc.? cetera? Um, I don't think it would be proper to discuss that kind of detail now. I said we are considering this. Uh, we do have uh, much work to do on this. We, as a matter of fact, we are flying zero-g trajectories, uh, uh, have been flying some zero-g tra trajectories with a mock-up of the spacecraft in it, astronauts suited up to see what the uh, detailed problems may be with such a task. Uh, until we know more about it and what all the requirements are and the constraints, uh, I wouldn't want to talk about it. Well, don't you have some estimate of the reasonable amount of time that you would have to, to perform this uh, particular feat to make it valuable? Uh, I think to make it valuable, you could do it in uh, five minutes. Uh, it involves depressurizing the spacecraft, uh, allowing the suit to come up to pressure, opening the hatch, uh, releasing your uh, restraint belts, standing up, sitting down, and reversing the procedure. Jinx. <clears throat> What is the status of the extravehicular spacesuit, uh, that is thermal protection and micrometeorite protection for the man in the right seat? Kenny? Well, we hope to have a suit available for GT4 that will allow us to do exactly the operation that Kenny talked about. It probably will not be adequately quali <coughs> excuse me, qualified to 
depart from the vehicle for an extended period of time. It'll be part of the development cycle to get that capability into it. An overgarment, or is, or is the thermal protection going to be integrated into the suit? I don't think we really know the answer to that right now. At least I don't. Uh, I think you probably should talk to the crew systems development people on that question. I can't tell you. Yeah. Uh, Mr. Klein, connect. Are thoughts being given to the possibility that the man who does stand up will just stand there and take a picture with a camera from his uh, standing position? Uh, I can't say we've thought about that in detail. Obviously, we will consider what else you can do uh, uh, if we should perform this. We'll take a picture for you. <laughs> Max? I've been asked by some of our European subscribers to ask uh, astronaut McDivitt if he has any Irish background. Well, I don't know. With a name like McDivitt, I guess you'd expect that. I sort of consider myself an American. I've got so many other things in me, too. But I, I guess I do have some Irish ancestry. Ordinary suit, I wear about 39 regular. Wear a 41 long. I've got the longest arms, too, that he was talking about. <laughs> if you represent a clothing manufacturer, maybe we can go down the line here. <laughs> 38. <laughs> Women's wear daily or something. Uh, at the start of this conference, if I could just interject, uh, I got a call from JPL, and they tell us that uh, Ranger 7 is uh, going along. All systems are quite nominal in their operation. They perform, performed a mid-course maneuver at 4 a.m. our time this morning, which was entirely successful. And they're predicting an impact uh, Friday morning somewhere between 7 and 9 our time. Uh, the impact area is uh, slightly northwest of the Sea of Clouds, for you lunar, lunar scholars. Thank you. Anything else? Warren? I'm wondering if uh, Mr. McDevitt and Mr. Flight would uh, collaborate on what are the most interesting aspects of this coming flight to them. First, this one's shore. Warren, that'd be pretty pretty tough to do. You, the whole flight, is, I think, is uh, is just a tremendous undertaking. Try to to try to single out any individual thing from this. From the vast number of experiences that we're going to run into, it I think it would be extremely difficult. You can't hardly separate the the launch from the recovery, obviously, and and nor can you separate them from the long period of time in orbit. So I I really don't know. Maybe Ed's got something he's looking forward to. <laughs> I think I I really have to uh, say that I feel somewhat the same way. I think the probably the most interesting uh, one of the most interesting parts will be that initial liftoff and the. Uh, experience of the long durations uh, in weightlessness will be something that we are all looking for some information in. Uh, this particular area has rather been of interest for, for me for some time since I had the opportunity to work uh, with the Air Force uh, weightless program in the C-135 and the C-131s at uh, Wright Pat. And we used to struggle to get anywhere from 20 to 30 seconds of weightless time, and we're going to be able to pick up uh, three to four days on this one flight. So uh, that'll be a highlight, of course. I think the opportunity that we might have of opening up the spacecraft and starting the first work toward the extravehicular type activity uh, will be, you know, you have to crawl before you can walk, and this is the way we'll approach extravehicular activities. This will be uh, the type of work that we're going to have to build up for not only uh, space stations and assembly of different type of structures in space, but we're going to have to certainly go extravehicular when we step out on the lunar surface. So I, I think uh, we're developing many of the blocks that we're using to build on each of our flights. These are the things that uh, I think pose the most interesting problems for us. Thank you. In the past, there has been talk about the fact that the life system circulation would uh, carry astronauts well past the target goal. Is there any possibility that you may go for more than four 
days and uh, maybe even try and stop the Russian thing. Any outside possible? Except the one for Kenny. Well, there's no plans for that now as... Uh, uh, who went it, Ed? Or just said uh, we think you have to uh, crawl before you walk. This is a, from uh, up to four days will be a significant uh, step beyond Mercury. We think this is the type of steps we have to take uh, to proceed into longer duration missions. About how long could this capsule and its astronauts remain up if they had to? Spacecraft is designed to have the capability for up to 14 days. Uh, Mr. Kreinkinek, when we talk about three to four days, what are we talking about in total numbers of orbits? We didn't say three to four days. We said up to four days, and uh, an orbit is about 90 minutes. I think you can figure it out. Here, go ahead yeah, about four times 16. Uh, four. Will you be having fuel cells and all the equipment aboard except for rendezvous radar this trip? GT-4 is planned to be conducted with batteries, Warren. Uh, it's not necessary to have fuel cells uh, for this type mission. Uh, the uh, weights are quite uh, compatible. That is, you don't pay but very little penalty for batteries. Batteries are a much simpler system, easier to check out, easier to provide. And uh, we would be pushing the f uh, fuel cells to try to put them in for at this time, too. Bill? What about food? Is there any problem with carrying enough food to furnish uh, nourishment to, to such eaters as these claim to be? <laughs> or Ed and I, there is. They'll never last four days. They cut the calories back. <laughs> no, there isn't know. a problem. I think probably Ken might elaborate on this. I know it's been following this area. Jim Lovell, why don't you pick that one up? You've been following this. There, there is no problem with food. I think uh, that the crew systems division people will even uh, satisfy the needs of our two worthy uh, crew members here. Much time we've been eating already. That's right. Uh, Frank just mentioned the fact that we have in our in our training program or our development program, we have been uh, sampling the foods uh, since we've been on board, and so we hope to have something that uh, is compatible to everybody. I think uh, we might touch a little more on this. They have some pretty interesting menus at their. Uh, getting up for us. Uh, they have uh, spaghetti and uh, then there's uh, different kinds of stew, sandwiches, shrimp, and uh, salmon. The only thing, they all have a somewhat similar taste, but <laughs> that, that, they're, really, they're really quite good. I think we're making very big steps in the food, uh, food area. We're going to have other problems. <laughs> we're, not, we're not worried too much about the food problems. How do you go about stew in space? Squeeze bottles? It's a pretty interesting uh, process. They, they freeze the food, and then they, uh, uh, which effectively takes the water out of it, and then we can reconstitute it by adding water in, and it uh, forms somewhat like a... It's not quite like baby food, but it does have some lumps and whatnot, and it reconstitutes into a uh, mixture that we can take right out of the little plastic bag, uh, somewhat like we did with the tubes that we squeezed out uh, in our earlier type foods. I wonder if uh, Dave or my David White would uh, break down uh, what the next eight months will be spent in phases of training moving toward the flight how you'll move from one phase of training into the actual. I might take just a quick introductory statement and turn it over to these gents. Uh, as you know, they have not been following Jimmy to any extent up to this point in time. Um, Mac, for example, has been following the Apollo command module. And uh, we'll continue to have them follow the areas that they've been involved in for, probably for the next month to two months until such time as our Gemini mission simulator is operational here in Houston. At that point in time, they'll then phase on into the work on Chimney Mission Number Four specifically, and I think from there on. Uh, you want to make, yeah. Well, 
Well, I think it'll be a little premature to, to lay out a schedule right now. I'd like to talk to uh, Gus and John and Wally and Tom to find out how things are going on GT3. As Deke indicated, we really haven't been following Gemini specifically. When we get a little better feeling for this, probably uh, at the end of this one or two month period that Deke was talking about, I'm sure we'd have a better feel for it. But obviously we're going to use the simulator, and obviously we're going to participate in this spacecraft systems test. And we're also going to be down at the Cape uh, prior to the flight for some period of time. Now, I really can't lay out these things right now. We'll just have to wait a while and see. You mentioned the centrifuge program as well. And Ed mentioned that there'll be the cent probably some centrifuge training. There'll be a lot of corollary training that'll go on. And we really don't have a detailed plan for that now. Houston for this flight versus McDonald for the GT3 crew seems to have camped perfectly. Uh, pick this one up. Uh, our plan is to have the crew follow the spacecraft full time wherever it happens to be. And of course, at the present time, this number three spacecraft is at McDonald. Uh, and they'll essentially live with it there until it does go to the Cape, at which time they'll go to the Cape with it. The same will apply to the number four crew and spacecraft four. They'll essentially live with this at Mac during the period it's there and then move on to the Cape. The difference is that uh, we will have the mission simulator operating here at Houston, and they will be traveling back and forth between Mac and Houston, working on the mission simulator specifically. When the number three crew goes to the Cape, the mission simulator there should be operational in number three configuration, and then they'll stay at the Cape. There'll be no requirement for them to travel. Two to three months under a present plan, yes. Gentlemen, we've had uh, jinx. Will the radar be ready for GT4? Um. We probably will have a um, rendezvous evaluation pod in GP, GT4, too, so we will have radar. Is, uh, how much uh, is the radar dependent on the fuel cell? For the, no, um, it is not. The batteries can supply enough power for it. How long will the radar operate on the GT4 mission with the pod? I'm sorry, I think I made a mistake there. We will not have the rendezvous evaluation pod in GT4. As a matter of fact, two of the experiments, uh, the um, proton electron spectrometer and the magnet uh, instrument that measures the Earth's magnetic field will be mounted in the place of the rendezvous evaluation pod, and we will not have radar in GT4. Well, what is wrong with the radar? Why? It was originally scheduled to go on GT3, was it not? <coughs> Uh, I don't know whether I can go back that far or not. It's not required for the mission we have outlined for GT4 now. Uh, there are many other things uh, involved in why we do each flight as we do it. Well, there, there seems to be a delay in the development of the radar. Can you tell me why? I don't think there's necessarily a delay in the development of the radar. There are many systems that uh, we have to put a lot of effort into to get them on any schedule. Uh, some, I guess you might say, a few of them come along very easily. Uh, radar is being flight tested now, and we have every reason to believe that we'll have it for GT5 now. We have the classic question that hasn't been asked here yet. What do their wives think of this? My wife thinks it's great. I was already a jet pilot when she married me, and she knew that I wanted to go to the test pilot school uh, before we ever got married. She's uh, accepted this, and she's as enthusiastic about airplanes and space flight as I am. So I think she's as pleased as I am. I think when you... Uh Consider that you work in this area, such as the testing, and then on into uh, the uh, business as an astronaut. Your family begins to live a part of it with you, and they understand your motivations better than anybody else. I think your wife can understand your own motivations <laughs> better than anyone else. And I think in this uh, light, 
you have to realize that they're part of it with us also. And as far as mine is concerned, she uh, knows what I want, and she supports me in this 100%. So she's quite uh, excited about the prospect also. You got a wife, Frank. Oh, I, I didn't. I didn't. I've been traveling this week, and I haven't asked her yet. <laughs> <laughs> I'm I'm mine just wiped her brow. <laughs> no, she thinks it's great, too. Yeah, so does mine. Uh, we want to get some the, the inevitable pictures taken with the suit, so if we want to uh, knock it off about it here, we'll ask the boys to change and uh, strike some of these uh, platforms from the stage and get, that, get the pictures out of the way. Thank you. Thanks very much.